Um, please welcome Professor David Snowden, who will give us our, our first introductory keynote. Professor Snowden, welcome. Welcome to Athens. Thank you very much. I'm Welsh, not English. You need to understand that, right? If you call me English, I'll start to mention the Turks, and we all know where we go from there. <laughs> we have a very similar history. Um, but we do tend to speak English very quickly. So if I start to do that, feel free to wave me down or, or slow me down. Again, that's not a problem. Yeah? Um, what I want to do is to introduce some of the complexity-based thinking and work we're doing. I'm going to develop this into the Canavian framework, which some of you know, but I'm going to be specifically talking about pre-scrum techniques in Agile. I, what you need to do before you even think about techniques like Scrum. Yeah? And they're all about handling high levels of uncertainty and very specifically looking at matching technology to unarticulated needs. Uh, one of the things I've been saying for years is that the whole Agile movement takes too much from manufacturing and not enough from service. Yeah, it assumes that users know what they want. Well, I've been in IT since the 70s. Yeah? I mean, I was taught how to use a punch card machine at school and told I'd have a job for life. It's rather the equivalent of teaching Java code to kids at the moment, all right, on the basis it might still be around when they graduate, right? Um, so I've been through computing. One of the things that we know is that users never want what they ask for, even though you can prove it, they always want something different instead. And one of the reasons for that is technology is moving faster than people know how to articulate a demand. Yeah, and that's actually a very interesting phenomenon. And as a result of which, when you give them something, they start to realize what they should have asked for. And that's when things start to go wrong and the change requests go up and everything else. So a lot of the failures, I think, of Scrum, and the failures don't get talked about about conferences. As somebody, one of the speakers said last night, if you actually talk about failure, they don't invite you back, which says something about learning, right? Um, but one of the many features about the level of failure, or the, the level of failure which should happen, is actually too high. And one of the reasons for that is a failure to think about stuff up front. It's the assumption is, here's a discrete chunk of work, I've got it on a Kanban card, it's in my backlog, I'll do it, I'll get a tick in the box, I'll move on. Yeah? And that's not a service relationship, that's a manufacturing relationship. So that's what I really want to hit. But in order to do that, I want to start off with some of the science on this, and I'm hoping that in Greece I can use a word like praxis. Yeah. Um, this is a phrase from the 70s we used a lot, praxis makes perfect. Right? Praxis is the interaction of theory with practice. Now again, one of the major issues you see in the Agile movement is an overemphasis on experience. Yeah, at, shall we say the extreme end of it, Somebody has a partial memory of three projects they run once from which they create a certification program and a method and assume it can be universal. Uh, that's safe, by the way. Right? Yeah, very little basis in either experience or, for that matter, in theory. And again, the problem is people throw together a limited amount of experience and they think they can generalize that. Now, there are several problems with this. Yeah? First of all, people don't remember things the way they happen. Sorry about that, we don't. Uh, we did a lot of work on this when I was in IBM, which I survived for seven years. I was conscripted, I didn't volunteer, but it was an interesting seven years. Um, we actually did a lessons learned process the day before and the day after people knew whether they'd won an outsourcing deal. Now, an outsourcing deal then was huge, all right? You, you know, bid budgets were measured in the million dollars, and it's a binary point. You won or you lost, and you're a hero or a villain. So we did lessons learned the day before they knew the result, lessons learned the day afterwards, scripted process, no variation in questions allowed. And you would think you were talking about different universes. The way people described history before they knew the result was a rich history, yeah, with lots of contingencies in it and lots of data. It was actually valuable data. The way they described it the day after they knew whether they'd won or lost was very different. If they won the deal, they only emphasized the logical sequence of ordered processes which arose from their management ability and their genius. They were reinterpreting the past, yet to actually say they'd done everything without any accidents. 
And if they failed, it was all bad luck, bad judgment, lack of resources. The history actually changed. Yep. Now, that's not just our experience. We know that as a general, general process. Human beings remember the past in order to meet the political contingencies of the present. If you didn't believe that before things like Trump, you shouldn't believe it ever, right? Yet fundamentally, we change our memory based on what we need at the moment. It's not that we're lying, it's just the way we are as a species. So you can't trust what people say. So let's take another, one of the two worst books in the Agile movement, Lean Startup. Anybody read Lean Startup? Yeah, very popular, isn't it? Right? Guy goes and studies, a group, listens to a group of executives who succeeded and believes what they tell him. And from that, he constructs a set of methods which he said you can now universalize. Well, we got a problem because he's only interviewing the people who succeeded. We did a massive project in IBM, working with Dorothy and Leonard at Harvard Business School, and we studied the people who failed as well as the people who succeeded. This is called basic science, all right? You don't just take a limited case. And what we found is that entrepreneurs, all right, the people who fail do all the same things as the people who succeed. It's just you've got a market. You've got so many players, some of them are bound to succeed. So you can't generalize that into a whole set of methods. doesn't mean there aren't useful things to do. Don't get me wrong. But the idea that you've got a recipe which will produce predictable results is really bad. Yeah. At the other end of the scale, probably the worst book in the Agile movement at the moment is Reinventing the Organization, the Lacroix book, where he only actually selects the aspects of cases which support the hypothesis he had before he started to write the book. Right? And that's completely inauthentic. But that is increasingly common. Yeah? Some of the big books in Agile at the moment is somebody has a popular thesis and they go and find aspects of cases to support that thesis, and that will work, right? Now, all of that is really bad science. Yeah. Uh, we've also got other problems. There's the thing called the uh, Cobra effect. This is from the English in India. Uh, when the Welsh say English and when we say British has significance, all right? So this is the English in India. They practiced colonization on us in the 13th century, all right, and, and, and carried it across it into India later. They decided there were too many hooded cobras. Now, having had a few close encounters with cobras, I agree, there's far too many of the things. They're quite nasty. So they announced a reward, one rupee, for every cobra head bought into the district commissioner. And everybody thought this was brilliant, so they started to do it. It worked really well for six months. Then people started to realize how much money there was to be had in breeding cobras. So cobra farms set up in backyards all over India. And the English got to hear about this, and they weren't very happy, so they cancelled the reward, at which point there was no money in cobras anymore, so they were released into the wild, and the cobra population went up, not down. Now, you see this in organizations. The chief executive officer announces a new change initiative, you know, based on somebody's pet theory or a book he read on the golf course. You know? uh, most management books can be read between the first and the ninth tee without any intellectual effort. So he announces this massive new change initiative, and what's happened? Oh, sorry. Everyone changes yeah, their pet project to use the language of the new initiative. Yeah, you see this in governments as well. That's called the Cobra effect. You know, so this keeps cutting. Do I need to worry about this? Okay. So I was working with Telstra in Australia, and they had waterfall projects. There are still waterfall projects in this world. We know what we've got to do, how long. I mean, Agile is actually not very good for large-scale infrastructure projects. Yeah, waterfall works better for that. But you didn't get promoted unless you were Agile. <laughs> so they ran one-year sprints. <laughs> I thought that was quite intelligent recently. And that's called the Cobra effect. And what you see is that somebody announces a method, they make money out of certification, Everybody latches on to that, and the thing actually magnifies because people accept the things uncritically. Yeah? And then you get Hawthorne effect. Uh, this is from experiments in the 1920s. They increased lighting levels in a cable manufacturer in Upper New York State, and people became more productive. So that's good news. These days, they'd now publish a book called Light, the Secret to Productivity, yeah, with 55 different ways by which you switched on lights with a certification program yeah, attached to it. But then they had some pretension to be real scientists, 
So they lowered the lighting levels, and people became more productive. And what they found, which has been replicated since, is novelty nearly always works the first time. If you do something which is different and you pay attention to it, it's going to work, it doesn't mean it will scale. And again, you've got to have at least 15 to 20 real cases where you've applied a method before you can trust it. Yet you can't derive a method from 15 cases because you'll only see the things in those cases that matter to you. And if you really don't believe me, then this is kind of like the killer punch to everything. Uh, for reasons that we don't understand, radiologists have offended the cognitive neuroscience community. Somewhere in their past, they did something really evil, and you know, everybody's out to get revenge on them, so all the experiments on cognitive bias are run on radiologists. Right? So radiologists are working off a five- to six-generation body of knowledge. Agile is working off a one- to two-generation, and that's significant. Yet yeah, if a profession has gone 15 or 20 generations, example nursing, there's a body of knowledge hard-baked into the, pro the apprentice models. Yeah? Yeah, yeah, radiology is fairly okay on that. Most radiologists have 10 to 15 years of experience. You give them a batch of x-rays and ask, to look, ask them to look for anomalies. And on the final x-ray, you put your picture of a gorilla, which is 48 times the size of a cancer nodule. 83% don't see it, even though their eyes physically scan it. And the scary thing is the 17% who do see it come to believe they were wrong when they talked to the 83%. Now, are you ever going to believe what people say based on partial observation after that? Yeah. This is fundamentally the way we are as a species. Yeah? Uh, just to give you the facts behind it, the most you scan of what's available to you on a good day, if you're really focused, is about 5%. 5% of the available information. You then match it against patterns stored in your brain, your body, your social connections, and your tools. This is a lecture for another day, but consciousness is a distributed function. It's not co-located with the brain. That's a really important thing people need to start to understand. But basically, you've got patterns stored there. A radiologist has 30 to 40,000 of them, on average, associated with their skill and training as a radiologist. And you do a first fit pattern match, not a best fit pattern match. And that's how you make a decision. And that's why they don't see the gorilla. Because they're only scanning 5% of the x-ray, they pick up things which are familiar, and they make a decision on that basis. Now, in evolutionary terms, you can see why this makes sense. If you think about the early hominoids on the savannas of Africa, or possibly the Mediterranean coast, there's some dispute about that at the moment. Something large and yellow with very sharp teeth runs towards you at high speed. Do you want to autistically scan all available data, <laughs> look up a catalogue of the flora and fauna of the African continent, and having identified lions, look up best practice case studies on how to avoid lions? I could get into some very heavy sarcasm about certifications on lion avoidance behavior, but I won't get into that. Right? Actually, what we evolved to do is to make a decision very, very quickly based on a partial data scan. Because it has evolutionary advantages. Yeah? In fact, the only document I know of any use in that circumstance is probably the book of Jonah from the Old Testament, which is the only documented example of how to escape from the digestive tract of a large carnivore. Right? We evolved to make decisions very, very quickly, privileging our most recent experiences, and overall, that makes sense. But it means we can't trust experience, and we can't trust it when we make decisions about methods. So what myself, my group, and other people have been working on is to use natural science as a constraint on method development. Because natural science replicates. Social science, nobody ever can replicate an experiment. You don't know it. You've got to be very careful when somebody says they have scientific evidence of any psychological phenomena, because of recent years, people have been trying to replicate the classic experiments, and they haven't been able to replicate them, which a lot of us could have said up front, because humans are com complex. There are so many contextual elements, you can never create a proper control. But in natural science, I can replicate the experiment so I can trust what it says. 
So the general approach is to say, what do we know about the nature of systems from natural science? That actually creates a constraint, and we create methods consistent with that. What do we know about cognitive science? We know that human beings make decisions based on patterns, privilege in their most recent experience. Right, we make methods based on that, rather than trying to pretend we can train them to do something different. Yeah, that's actually really important. Right? So that's kind of like where we're coming from. And the technical name for that is praxis. Okay, so let's move on to the first and the most critical of the sciences. That's the science of complex adaptive systems theory. Now, language mutates over time. And the language here is not yet used consistently. Some people will use complexity, where I will use chaos and vice versa. It's an emerging field, so everybody should define their terms, all right? So that's what I'm going to do. And what I'm going to do is to use the constraint-based definition. And I haven't got time to go into this today, but one of the big things we now do with executives is to map constraints before we even decide what should happen. Because the constraints indicate what you can change and where you can't change things. Yeah? And I'll say this up front now, and I'll come back to this at least once more. The big difference between complex thinking and systems thinking, and they are not the same thing, complexity is not a subset of systems thinking, yeah? is systems thinking manages uncertainty by defining a desired future state and trying to engineer a path towards that. Complexity focuses on, de on describing the current state and identifying what we can change in that. So complexity starts journeys rather than setting goals. Right? And that's actually a really important principle in the future of software development because the potential, if you actually start journeys, is to spot things you couldn't have anticipated until you did something. As long as you've got goals, you get a focus on goal achievement regardless of the consequence. And that's a massive problem with KPIs and everything else in the modern organization. So in nature, we have three types of system, ordered systems, complex systems, and chaotic systems. And the changes between them go through a phase shift. That's, again, important to realize. This is not a spectrum. It's actually a se three separate systems, and there's a phase shift between them. If you don't get phase shifts, how many people remember latent heat from university? Anybody? Okay, I'll do a reminder, all right? It's amazing how much we forget. My kids always laugh at me um, in the UK when I come in in the morning. Well, they're not kids anymore. Uh, one of them is 30 and has decided I don't understand Deleuze and is writing an essay on my unappreciation of uh, assemblage theory. But you know, when they were younger, they laughed at me as opposed to writing critical essays. All right? I'm not sure which I prefer, right? So either way, I come in and I say, it's going to snow. And Ellie or somebody will say, why? And I said, I can smell it. Now, I grew up in the country. I can smell snow coming. I grew up climbing. Yeah, now, actually, my kids haven't got that because they didn't train themselves to do it. But the reason I can smell it is there's a chemical change. When you go from liquid to solid, there's a heat is thrown out, and that's what causes a minor sensation which you can pick up. It's like when you boil water, it reaches a point... Yeah, at 100 degrees, then you have to keep putting more heat in before it will make the phase shift to steam. Right? So that's called a phase shift. Yeah? And by the way, in human systems, phase shifts can happen catastrophically. And of course, once you've gone a phase shift, the energy to go back is much higher than the energy to prevent the change. And you start to think through the implications of that. It's actually quite important. So basically, we have three types of system. Ordered systems, complex, chaotic. An order system has such a high level of constraint that all behavior is predictable. And that's good news. Yeah, and the example I always give is an operating theater. Yeah, how many people have been into an operating theater? Uh, vertically, not horizontally. Okay. Again, and I've been in horizontally once and vertically twice. On the two vertical occasions, I almost got divorced. Right? Uh, both my children were caesarean sections. They were, to quote Shakespeare, from their mother's womb, untimely ripped. Right? And the trouble is, I grew up in a household with a vet as a farmer, as a father, and so animals were being dissected on the kitchen table, you know, while breakfast. Yeah? Um, so actually, I, I just decided this was a fascinating operation, and it wasn't until about 10 minutes in I realized I wasn't there to watch the operation and ask questions of the surgeon. I was there to provide nurture and succor, and then I made the same mistake two years later, all right? But I think I've been forgiven, yeah? 
Either way, when you go into an operating theatre, you go through this huge process of scrubbing up. Yeah? Now, it's quite interesting. That is necessary for hygiene, but what it also does is aligns identity with role. Yeah? You remember you scan 5%? Well, actually, what happens is once you've been through that ritual, you start to scan using a different part of the brain and the body. So instead of becoming who you were, you become the role that you've been trained to occupy. It's called a crew. You see the same in the Air Force. You see the same in a pilot. The pilot goes through a set of checklists. The checklists are actually, it's called cognitive activation. They're switching people to being the pilot, not the role. Now as a result of that, and remember that comes from years of training and several generations, things like checklists work brilliantly. Right? So we check the number of surgical instruments left at the end of an operation and check it's the same number as was there at the start. As I get older, I think this is of increasing importance. Right? I know the figures are how many people had to have a second operation because people left scalpels or forceps in their stomach because it was very... It gets pretty bloody down there in an operation, right? It's easy to lose things, right? And it works. The trouble is then people got obsessed with it and they took it out of context. And this is the big problem with methods. People don't study the context. They assume things are context-free, whereas in complexity, things are context-specific. So the context of checklist working is a highly ritualized, professional, trained environment. Interestingly, with two separate bodies of knowledge operating, nurses have experience, then gain theory. Doctors start with theory, then gain experience. And you'll find most of the professions have that juxtaposition of two different evolutionary pathways, which gives you more diversity in scanning. It works. But then people took it elsewhere. So we're working with BC Hydro in, in Canada, and they had a problem that critical deaths had gone up. You know, it, it's not fun when you go from zero deaths to five deaths in one year, even though it's a hazardous environment. I mean, they repair power lines. In winter, it's so cold, you have to wear a mask because if the oxygen gets into your lungs, you freeze to death. And for five months of the summer, there are more grizzly bears than there are people around, all right? And that has other consequences. But the way it used to work is they'd all get on a truck, they'd arrive at the power line down, they'd all smoke a cigarette and talk about the job. Now what they were doing was the equivalent of scrubbing up. They were mentally rehearsing the job and triggering their interaction. Then some idiot of a management consultant came along and decided this wasn't valid unless it was made explicit. So he rendered a naturally evolved social process into an explicit set of instructions what now happens is the foreman ticks the boxes and says, we've done this, have we, lads? There's no mental rehearsal, and that was the reason they had deaths. Yeah? And again, there's a whole body of stuff you can go on in IT on this. I'll give some examples downstream. Yeah? So two examples from IBM to illustrate the danger of this. Um, after IBM took us over, the, one of the first things they did was to decide we were inefficient, right? You, you always wonder about this. Large companies take over small companies because they're dynamic and successful, and then they decide they're inefficient because they lack sufficient bureaucracy. You, you wonder about the logic here, but never mind. And so we used to have about eight, you know, a group of us were general managers. We had our own resource, and we swapped resource when we needed, and it kind of like worked. And we weren't allowed to do that anymore. Three resource managers were created with resource pools, and now if you had a project, you had to submit a computer-based request for the skills you wanted. And the computer would allocate you a team. We took one look at that, and we went off to a pub that we designated as the how do we deal with IBM story pub, all right? It was kind of like, you know, we knew no IBMers would go there, but they didn't know about it, and therefore we were safe, all right? And so we had the three resource managers there, and we came up with a good arrangement. So three resource managers, they each assigned themselves one hour in the morning, one hour in the afternoon, where they had complete control of the system. And I would then phone up Tony, and known Tony for years, worked with him for a long time. He was the guy put onto the DSDM consortium when we got that started, right? Good guy. And I'd say, Tony, I've got an interesting project. Now, Tony knows that when I say interesting, it means the edge of what's possible, and I haven't worked out how to do it yet, but I'm pretty sure we'll manage on the day, right? If you're good at this, you get to do it for the rest of your life. If you're bad at it, you only get to do it once. So it's an evolutionary process. Yeah? 
But either way, Tony is now paying attention. If I gave an IBM resource scheduler interest, then it wouldn't be noticed. Tony knows what I mean by that. I say we got the client from hell like we had on the Channel 4 data warehouse. We got the interface problems we had at Allied. And do you remember that mess we got into at Guinness? In two or three minutes, I've explained a highly complex problem, which I couldn't write down all of that. Tony then works out the team I should have, and he, Tony's really good at finding people to work with me who I wouldn't pick, so I trust him on that. He then makes sure that their CVs match the, chain, the request that we put in, so he and I write the change request to exactly match their CVs, and the schedule exactly matches when he's made sure they're available on the system, and he submits the, the request for the skill and the, in one of his hours, and I get the team. Yeah. Now, of course, you're not allowed to do this in IBM, but we do it, it works well, but then they decide they want feedback, so I get a questionnaire. It says, were you happy with the team the system gave you? Now, I know that Tony's bonus is dependent on me being happy. So I said I was deliriously happy with the team, it was wonderful. One year later, we got this email which says, you know, this is one of the most popular systems we've introduced since we took you over. Yeah, but certain people are gaming the system, so we're putting in more rules and regulations to further automate things, so we had to go back to the pub and work out some more workarounds. Yeah? The reality is human beings can make decisions that computers can't. I and mean, I remember removing all trace of Fortran and COBOL from my CV in 1993. I knew what was coming. Yeah, I didn't want anybody to know I could do that. Yeah, it, was, it was quite dangerous. Yeah? And you can't put things down like, this guy is a bloody good prototyper, but for Christ's sake, don't let him run a real project. Yeah, you just can't put that stuff down, but it's the stuff that everybody knows. And then the really brilliant one was um, they banned us from having alcohol in the office and charged us for coffee. Now, this was completely unreasonable. All right? We're a software development house. All right? The coffee alcohol cycle is critical to quality software development. Nobody should be expected to speak with users without alcohol first. <laughs> you then need coffee to sober up. And then you need even more alcohol because, as I said earlier, users never want what they can prove they asked for. They want something else instead. Either way, we got around that. Yeah, that was fairly easy. We just had off-site meetings where they billed us for accommodation and didn't mention the alcohol and the coffee. So that was cool. Yeah? Um, and then it got worse. They banned us for buying food from staff. Yeah, they said, you can't buy food for staff anymore, it's a waste of time. Uh, this is highly appropriate a story, by the way, for where, we're, where we are in Athens. Right? So by now, we'd learned that you didn't argue with IBM executives on the basis of evidence-based policy, customer need, employee need. That didn't work. Yeah, the only thing which worked was a Socratic technique in which you asked them questions till they contradicted themselves. You get trained on this in philosophy. It's a lot of fun. right? But you always have to remember what happened to Socrates when the people of Athens got fed up of it. Yeah, it's kind of, you know. So sooner or later, it catches up with you. Right? So either way, so we went in and we said, look, you know, this is one of the, obviously one of the major benefits of joining IBM. We would never have thought of banning buying food from staff. This is brilliant. And then we realized irony was a deadly weapon because they didn't recognize it. Right? And I said, you know, a couple of weeks, you know, a couple of weeks ago, I got called out at 4 o'clock in the morning. Yeah? Uh, we got a VAX cluster which has gone down. I didn't say, because this was actually the problem, that they cancelled training budgets so they wouldn't train systems programmers because they said they could do upgrades from the manual. And even though we lost money on this, nobody got punished for it because the guy had achieved his targets on reducing expenditure. So there's no point in going down there because that's a waste of space. Right? So he said, you know, the only thing I can do, because I'm now a C-level executive, that means I only see angry customers. This is one of, the, one of the problems. The more you get promoted, the more you only see angrier and angrier customers as you go up the ladder. Just remember this when you criticize managers. All right? That's what they're facing on a daily basis. All right? the, the, the nice times you keep for yourselves. You don't escalate it. All right? So I said, yeah, it's 4 o'clock in the morning. I don't know how to manage a bloody vax cluster, for Christ's sake. I'm not a systems programmer. The only thing I can do is to keep everybody away from the two systems programmers who are trying to get this back up and stop people asking them what they're doing to report things. It's a golden rule, by the way, in software support. If you have a problem, assign one of your team to phone up the customers every half hour and give them a meaningless task. 
because then they feel they're involved in the process and you get time to actually solve the problem. Don't just assume they'll trust you to get on with it, all right? It doesn't work like that. Right? Just trying to pass on some experience here. Right? So I said, that's all I can do, all right? And the other thing is I've got to keep them awake, so I've got to buy them pizza and Coke. So what do I do? And they looked a bit worried, and I realized they could have got that wrong. So I said, we do mean Coca-Cola. <laughs> At which point they breathed a sigh of relief, but it did give us some ideas, all right? I mean, we had a lot of these crises. Um, and I said, so what do I do? And they said, okay, we understand this, all right? They said, vice presidential approval, 48 hours in advance, it will be okay. Now, at this point, you breathe very slowly. And you say, God, we would never have thought of that. You know, 48 hours notice of a crisis, that's genius, all right? Then you realize that sarcasm is a weapon as well as irony, because they don't get that either. And we said, what happens on the very rare occasion where we don't get 48 hours notice of a crisis? And then they said yes in a way which means no. <laughs> Bureaucrats are brilliant at this, right? They said country general manager approval after the event. Now, if you work for IBM, you know that means your expenses will disappear into the South Bank. They'll never be signed. And if you complain about it, your name will appear on the wrong sorts of lists, right? You don't want to be on those lists every quarter end during the recession. It's a bad place to be. So the practice emerged. I hasten to add that nobody I knew, and of course I would never do this, we just heard about other people doing this, just to be clear, of overtipping London taxi drivers. Because if you overtip a London taxi driver, they give you a blank receipt. The blank receipt was then filled out for the amount of pizza and coke built for the staff. A parallel set of books were kept, and the responsible manager took the bus and claimed for the taxi. And everybody was happy. So I gave this, alliance, this example at the Scrum Alliance conference in Berlin a few years ago. Um, three people from IBM ran up to me afterwards, showed me wallets with blank receipts, and said, we're still doing that. Did you invent it? <laughs> this is 17 years later. Just on a sideline there, by the way, there's about 20% of costs that could be taken out of any company by removing meaningless rules which are forcing people to put energy into working around them. It's like in nurses in the UK at the moment, they have to break the rules every day to provide empathetic care to patients. And that's wrong. Yeah? But you see what happens, all right? I've assumed that order is a universal, and I've tried to work on the basis of how things should be, not how things are. So order is valuable if you put the investment into training and, and practice. But the danger is you get catastrophic failure if you actually apply it inappropriately. Because from IBM's point of view, everything looked ordered. But in reality, huge amounts of energy were going into making the system look ordered so that it could really work. And that's a big problem. It's a problem with a lot of the scale techniques as well. People try and pretend they're doing it because the company of dollars on the process, but the reality is they're working around the system all the time to make things work, and that's just a waste of everybody's energy. So that's order. A chaotic system is one with no constraints, or rather no effective constraints. We're talking about human systems here, not mathematics at this point. Yeah? So basically, if I've got no effective constraints, everything is random. No constraints, nothing is connected with anything else, it's all over the place. If that happens accidentally, it's a disaster, but it never lasts for long. One of the things a lot of people get wrong is they assume chaos is a permanent state. It isn't. It's a temporary state. Yeah. Basically, some sort of constraints emerges very quickly. If you can deliberately create a chaotic environment, then you get innovation. And as I'll show you in a minute or two, it's what we're now using for distributed decision support. Multiple agents making decisions without any connection with any of the other agents in real time so that we can find the 17% in the company who's seen something that the 83% are missing. Coming back to where I started. So chaos has utility. Accidentally, it's temporary. To create it deliberately takes a huge amount of energy. It's rather like nuclear fission. You know, the energy for the magnetic fields to contain the plasma is more than you get out of it. So it's a big investment when you do it. And then we get complex systems. 
In complex systems, everything is connected with everything else, but we don't know what the connections are half the time. We have a thing called a dark constraint. Um, something I didn't invent, but I think I was the first to describe them. Uh, it's a reference to dark energy in cosmology. We can see the impact of a constraint, but we can't see what the constraint is. So in human beings, for example, narrative history is often an unseen constraint. The story of what happened before. I was working with one of the big fashion houses in London three days ago. They've just done two mergers, and actually one of the hidden constraints is the stories of previous mergers that nobody knows because they're buried deep in the organization, but they're modifying people's behavior. Now, actually, historical narrative does that in that way. So those are dark constraints. So a complex system is inherently unknowable, and this is the key thing to get across, a complex adaptive system is not causal, it's dispositional. There is no linear relationship between cause and effect. You can't say, if I do this, this will happen, because next time something different will happen. If the same thing happens again the same way twice, it's by accident, not by design. But I can measure the dispositional state of the system, so I can say the energy gradients of the system indicate that this is more likely and this is less likely. This is an easier pathway, this is a difficult pathway. This is area has potential for a rapid unexpected phase shift. I, it could change very quickly in an unexpected way. And that's called dispositionality. And that, by the way, is one of the big reasons, one of the big areas of work at the moment is a complex systems approach to architecture because architecture and software development is stuck in the 1930s engineering models. It's not taking an ecological approach. Yeah? If you look at it, everybody argues about TOGAF and alternatives to TOGAF, but all the alternatives look just like TOGAF. It's just a different set of boxes with a different set of arrows. Yeah? And we've got to rapidly rethink architecture. Coming back to the speaker conversation last night, and I'll throw this out for anybody who's interested. People are objects too, not just software. And if you start to think about that, you start to change the way you think about architecture. But I can come back to that right at the end. Yeah? So a complex system is inherently unknowable. Now, the best way I've learned to ever explain this is to take a real case. So how many people have managed a party for a bunch of nine-year-old kids? OK, so let's look at how we manage a party for a bunch of nine-year-old children based on which type of system it is. Yeah? And by the way, you're holding the party in your own house. Um, that's a fundamental error. I mean, one of the things you learn pretty fast as an adult is community centers are really valuable for parties because they have fire hoses. <laughs> fire hoses are very useful for cleaning up after a party and they're occasionally necessary for crowd control during the party itself. <laughs> so let's look at how we would manage a children's party based on which type of system it is. So if we say a children's party is chaotic, that means there are no constraints. The children's behavior is entirely random. They can do whatever they want, which means they'll probably discover drugs and alcohol and go on a personal experience of self-discovery. <laughs> uh, your house may burn down in the process, but you know, all property is theft, and it was socially constructed in the first place, so why are you worried about it? Uh, there's a stiletto in that for a lot of academics and organizational change consultants. Right? Um, I don't recommend this. I've got a friend in California who did it once. He'd just come back from Burning Man, and he was in an idealistic frame about self-organizing systems. All right? He's never, ever going to do it again. All right? The recovery cost was high. The audit approach, on the other hand, is actually taught in any good management school or any scaled agile framework. Right? Under this, it's of critical importance to have learning objectives defined for the party before you start the party. The learning objectives should be aligned with the mission statement for education and society to which you belong and should be clearly articulated in memorable phrases and printed off with motivational posters with pictures of eagles soaring over valleys and water dropping into ponds and placed around the room, your room where you're going to hold the party. As the children come into the party, they're given Disney playing cards with a party mission statement printed on the back so they're aware of them all the way through it. And of course, you've produced a project plan for the party. The project plan has clear milestones throughout the party against which you can measure progress against ideal party outcome. 
And a senior adult starts the party with a motivational DVD. You don't want the children wasting time in play which isn't aligned with the learning objectives. And then he or she uses PowerPoint to demonstrate their personal commitment to the party objectives and show the children how their pocket money and allowances are linked to the achievement of the milestone targets. Following the highly successful completion of the party, you conduct an after-action review, update your best practice database on party management, and mandate future process improvements. If at this stage, for any remote reason, the children aren't happy, then you hire one of the happiness consultants who've grown up with the Agile community to give them a, <laughs> yeah, a happy, clappy two-day session. Yeah. At the end of which, they'll like whatever you put in front of them because it's easier than going through that experience ever again in their lives. Right? That's actually an ordered systems approach. A complex systems on, approach on the other is much simpler, and it's used when swear words here, but it's necessary. We start off by drawing a line in the sand, known as a boundary constraint in complexity, and we look the children squarely in the eye, and we say, cross that, you little bastards, and you die. <laughs> and one of the things you learn pretty fast as an adult is the value of flexible, negotiable boundaries, because rigid boundaries have a habit of becoming brittle and breaking catastrophically when you least expect it. We then introduce catalytic probes, a football, a barbecue, a DVD, whatever, in a hope a pattern of play will form, which is called an attractor. I can't create attractors, I have to catalyze them. Yeah? If it's a beneficial one, I push more children towards it, so it can actually absorb the energy. If it's a negative one, well, that's where I deploy the fire hoses. So what I actually do is I manage, and this is the key phrase, the emergence of beneficial coherence, within attractors, within boundaries, and that sequence is important. And I manage the only things you can manage in a complex adaptive system, the boundary conditions, the catalysts, and the amplification strategy. Everything else is a complete waste of time. Yeah? And that's actually the problem with all of these highly planned techniques. 90% of the method is a complete waste of time if the system is complex, but there are only three things you can manage. Yeah? So from that, yeah, we move into the Kinevin framework, which I'll do briefly, and I want to finish off with some other points. Oh, sorry, one other thing quickly. Right? I'm going to leave this one with you. Right? You can't scale a complex system by aggregation or imitation. So you can't just chunk things up into bigger and bigger units. Yeah? The scale frameworks are wrong in theory as well as practice. You can only scale a complex adaptive system by decomposition and recombination in a different context. And optimal granularity is key here. Yeah? In fact, my main objection to SAFE has always been, I, I wrote a blog on this called The Infantilization of Management, which I think was the best title I've come up with for years. All right? um, basically, its problem is that it's wrong in theory. It assumes you can scale what is a complex system by treating it by increasing the level of order. And therefore, it only succeeds by good people working around it rather than following it. And as somebody said to me the other day, I, I provoke somebody on Twitter about SAFE from time to time if I get bored. Um, the trouble is, he, he won't respond anymore because he's realized I'm doing it. I'm going to have to find another victim. <laughs> and his defense was, well, SAFE's a Trojan horse, right? It allows us to get Agile in. And I said, well, you, you just need to go and read the Iliad, all right? Trojan horses involving rape, mass pillage, and murder, right? But, He's still recovering from that one. Yeah? So hold that one on scaling. So Kinevin, um, it's a Welsh word. Um, it's drawn like this. It's important to realize it's not drawn like this, with that added later to keep me happy. All right? um, it's an open model, or an open framework, to be more precise. It is, by the way, a framework, not a model. That's an important distinction. A framework allows you to look at things from different perspectives. A model seeks to represent reality. Yeah, it's, it's like the difference between a typology and a taxonomy. A taxonomy forces you to put things into boxes. A typology says look at things from these perspectives. Yeah, and those are two distinctions which people need to realize. And Kinevin divides order into two. 
And I'll go through this quickly because there's lots of material. This Keo has got stuff on Agile. But basically, there's one where the order is obvious and the other where it's complicated. Now, where it's obvious, so for example, I'm in Greece, so I drive on the right-hand side of the road. I think in London, I drive on the left-hand side of the road. It's self-evident, everybody will follow it. It doesn't apply in Italy, south of Naples, by the way. <laughs> that has been studied, all right? It, it, the drivers south of Naples flock, they don't follow rules. So if you follow the next car, match speed, avoid collision, you have a stress-free driving experience, all right? I've driven the Alfini coast using that method, it works. So basically, everybody can see the relationship between cause and effect. We all buy in it, so we can apply best practice. And I have very rigid constraints. I didn't mean to do that. Let's go back. If it's complicated, then actually it's not self evident, so I sense, analyze, respond. So though for an expert it may be self-evident, for the decision maker it isn't. So they have to bring in experts or do some sort of analysis. And you can never be totally certain of the result. There's a degree of ambiguity about this. So we apply good practice, not best practice. And that's a really important distinction. Because in good practice, you have governing constraints, but you allow freedom within the constraints. So if you've got the right training, you've got a degree of freedom about what you do, you're not forced into one way of doing things. And that's a big mistake. Certainly consultants like forcing everything into the obvious domain because it makes for neater reports, right? The reality is a lot of mistakes are made by forcing people to choose one way of doing things when people know there are eight or nine valid ways of doing things, but they'll only know it when the situation arises. So that's a good best practice distinction. If you get order wrong, the bottom of Kinevin is drawn effectively as a crisis curve, then you fall into chaos. And actually, then you get novel practice. Um, and here, I act, sense, respond. It's a crisis management process. Now, the other thing about Kinevin is Kinevin is liminal, so I can draw another boundary which looks like this. So this is complex. In a complex world, I probe sense respond. Remember the children's party? I actually throw out a bunch of catalysts. Now notice I do it in parallel, not in sequence. Remember the Hawthorne effect? If I do one in an experiment and it works, it doesn't mean it will work again. And this, by the way, is a huge conflict resolution device. You don't try and resolve whose idea is right. Anybody with a coherent idea gets a short experiment. So the key thing to understand about a complex world is you do small, parallel, safe-to-fail experiments, and practice is ex-aptive. Now, that's not going to be a familiar word. That's from evolutionary biology. Um, and I'm safe, I assume, here. I have a real problem in the States at the moment. And I've had to work with um, somebody who's a young Earth creationist, which is always interesting. 35% of the U.S. population are creationists. And I'm not allowed to mention evolution with the work I'm doing with the Ebola management groups because it's a controversial theory, right? You worry about this. You know, those whom the gods would destroy, they first send mad, all right? Um, either way, coming back to this, acceptation. So adaptation is a linear process of evolution. And so you can see it with the dinosaurs' feathers. Oh, and by the way, all dinosaurs had feathers. Yeah, we now know that, all right? So it's one, one over on young kids because their books aren't up to date on this. Um, but basically, it looks like it was mostly for, for sexual display. So some dinosaurs, their forelimbs developed flaps of skin with colored feathers on them. So that made them more prominent. And those are the dinosaurs that fell off cliffs. And that's how we got flight. If you had a lot of feathers, you fly. And that's what acceptation is. And the conditions of stress, a trait which evolved for one function, exaps for something completely novel. After that, it adapts. The cerebellum at the base of your brain evolved to manipulate muscles in fingers so that you could pick seeds from seed pods. It exaps in humans to manage grammar in human language. And if you look at evolution, we now know it's not survivor of the fittest, it's survivor of the luckiest. Yeah, it's that ability to very quickly accept. 
It also applies in technology. In 1945, a Raytheon engineer maintaining the magneto of a radar machine noticed that a chocolate bar melted in his pocket. He wasn't the first person. Lots of people had done this and had their trousers clean. He realized the significance. We got microwave ovens. If you look at the whole pharmaceutical sector, it's entirely dependent on people noticing side effects which create novel uses. Yeah? Exactive practice is key to complexity. It's the ability to rapidly repurpose something that you know how to use for something completely novel. And if you want some technology examples, IBM repurposed punch cards designed for sewing machines to give them first mover advantage in technology. Apple repurposed Next to create a novel operating system. Yeah, repurposing or acceptation is key here, and that requires a very different approach to lessons learned and practice than the one that people normally do. Now, one of the points I want to make on this is the liminal areas are transition areas. Liminality is a state of holding things in suspension before you change. Remember, it's a phase shift. Scrum is a liminal technique, not a complex technique. By the time you hit Scrum, you can like more or less work out what we need to produce. Yeah, so you're ready to shift it into the complicated domain where you can exploit it. That's its value. Things which can move things from complex to complicated are some of the most valuable things we've got because then we can do things at scale. But I'm doing a single iteration to make it right. If we look at pre-Scrum techniques, let's just throw out a couple. One we originally developed for DSDM, uh, which actually was a pre-agile technique, except it was formed by three competing companies on the basis that we wanted an international standard and a proprietary tool. Kind of went wrong after that, but that's how it started. Um, we called it Triple Eight. So we did a fast prototyping team, yeah, a JAD team, Joint Application Design. And by the way, good prototypers are very rarely good coders. As it, we actually found this. People who are really good at prototyping were really poor on development teams. They just had a different mental framework. Yeah? So this is a good way. So eight hours, joint application development, produce a working prototype in the UK, chuck it into Mumbai without the original user requirement and say, improve it. After eight hours, they chucked it to San Francisco, improve it, it came back. There's an English children's game called Chinese Whispers. You whisper into the ear of a child and they whisper to the next one, they whisper, that's what we were doing. We were deliberately introducing mutation. Every time we did it, the users looked at it and said, God, we wouldn't have thought of that. Can we have it? Yeah, so we're doing very fast one-day cycle processes before we even think about a scrum. Yeah. We're also using triplets. So that's a pair programming team to which you add a user trained to talk to IT people. It's a lot easier to train users to talk to IT people than to train IT people to understand users. <laughs> I say you throw 15 triplets at a problem for a week in their spare time to see how they define it. You don't send out systems analysts. You see how I'm applying the theory? I need diversity of scanning within the system. I can't afford for a single trackway. Right? And again, that's one of the big things we're trying to get people to understand in Agile. All of the methods and tools in Agile have value, including the old ones we've abandoned, like time boxes. There's nothing bloody wrong with time boxes. They were a brilliant technique. You know, three months, I'll always deliver on that date, but I'll vary the delivery or vary the resource. It's another technique. All time boxes don't have to be two weeks. Nothing wrong with waterfall. Different techniques work in different spaces, but the real area of interest is to develop the upfront stuff. Yeah. Again, that's where we're now not using systems analysts. We're getting users to record their day-to-day -day frustrations in journals over three months. And then we're looking for coherent patterns in those frustrations and going to suggest how technology could help. Yeah, because we're getting much better data in terms of the way it works. And that's called unarticulated need management. So it's actually creating a complex ecology for Agile than anything else. So that's kind of like that. And the thing I love about the iPen, iPencil, is I can now take that as a picture, and you still get it. OK, a couple of things to finish up on. This is a dispositional map. This is actually when we're working on a peace and reconciliation. It's one of my favorite ones. So what we've actually done here is we've prevented an infographic about how the future should be to a large population of people. 
we've got them all to interpret it into what's called high abstraction metadata, a technique we developed and patented. It's where people don't know what answer you want. You've, I'll do it very quickly. You've all filled out an employee satisfaction survey? Yeah, and you get this question, does your manager consult you on a regular basis, zero, not at all, 10 all the time? Everybody familiar with that one? And you know exactly what answer they want. Yeah? We do something different. We ask a non-hypothesis question. What story would you tell your best friend if they were offered a job in your work group? Then we ask them to interpret the story, and they interpret it onto six triangles. One of the triangles says the manager's behavior was altruistic, assertive, analytical. So they don't know what the right answer is, and a different part of the brain comes into action. It's a cognitive load. So in Clyderman's terms, you go from thinking fast to thinking slow. So we get deeper data, and it's ungameable. So that's kind of like what we've done. Now you can see here that the green and the blue guys, there's no point in getting them to sit down and talk about peace and reconciliation because they interpret the same data in radically different ways. The only thing they agree is they hate the red guys. So actually the strategy here is to actually, you may or may not like this, but our strategy here is to make these guys more extreme so that this becomes a new possibility. You see what I mean about managing dispositional states? This is the same technique, we discover outliers. So you present, we just did one recently on North Korea. So you present an infographic of a situation you get all your employees to interpret it, and you look at the dispositional patterns, and you find the clusters of people who are thinking about the problem in a different way, and you go and talk with them before they get homogenized by the dominant way of thinking. This is using chaos theory. Yeah? This is actually, by the way, a really good way of doing initial stage user requirements. It's present to large numbers of people, see how they interpret it, and go through three or four iterations on that. We're now doing that as a real-time decision support system. And of course, we can, from that, move into dispositional mapping. So this is an example, and this is where I'll just briefly do a new theory of change. Right? So you can here, you can see the contour maps of dispositional mapping. These are actually measuring attitudes to safety. And by the way, attitudes are a lead indicator, compliance is a lag indicator. Now, we're doing this now on cybersecurity. If you focus on compliance breaches, everybody's panics. If you measure attitudes, you've got a lead indicator, intervention is much easier. So we present an infographic about a real breach. People tell a story about why it couldn't happen here, they index it. They tell a story about what they would do if it did happen here. And so we can measure one for complacency, we've got a scenario planning tool, and we can produce a map which shows people's attitudes to cybersecurity. This is actually looking at safety. The left-hand one is civilian manufacture, the right-hand one is military manufacture. The vertical dimension is rule compliance, the horizontal dimension is job completion. And this is based on three months of engineers capturing micro-experiences on the floor of the factory rather than responding to a survey. Now you can immediately see in civilian aircraft what the problem is. You either follow the rules or you get the job done. They're mutually incompatible states. All of the questionnaires, all of the focus groups, all of the expert interviews say they're doing both because they know that's the right answer. And if they say they're not doing it, they'll be investigated and all sorts of things will happen. So that's bad news, right? Nobody on the board challenged me when we showed this, by the way. They kind of like knew it was happening, but now we have the evidence. The right-hand one, you've got that cluster at the top right. This is military. The trouble is when you click on that, you discover it's nuclear weapons testing which has an existential quality about it, you know, which means rule compliance and job completion has a sort of contextual incentive you don't get elsewhere. You then got, get the job done, ignore the rules, and you've got, I've given up, it's all getting too hard. That's actually the pattern we're seeing with nurses in British hospitals as well. In a crisis, they're brilliant, day-to-day -day basis break it. Now the change here, and this will challenge a lot of the things you get taught with in Agile, is not to get everybody together and say, wouldn't it be wonderful if we were up here? Yeah, this is a sort of visioning stuff everybody takes you through. That's too far away from where people are. Oh, and by the way, if you want to do a change initiative in a company, the worst possible thing you can do is to announce you're doing a change initiative. 
because everybody will either play politics or they'll say, oh my God, here we go again. What's the new language? How do I keep these people off my back? Right? Yeah? What we do here is we say, well, we need to shift this. This, which is called incomplexity, an adjacent possible, is actually a stepping stone. Remember I said we start journeys? We don't try and achieve goals. So what I do is I literally click on this, I look at what's underneath it, and I say, what can I do as a board to create more like this and fewer like that? Now this is a whole new theory of change. If we say we're doing this now for agile teams, agile teams can prompt people to tell stories every time they interact with them in which they index. And you don't say, how can we move more customer focused? You say, how can we create more stories like these and fewer stories like that? Everybody can understand that. It doesn't privilege a change consultant. And of course, it's not just there. So that's the board level one. In this one, by the way, the intervention was to say, if you've got 10 years experience and somebody with five years experience signs it off, you can break any rule provided you document it. Which is very sensible if you think about it. So they created a rule about when rules could be broken which is kind of like recognizing reality, but they created a process to manage it on the other side. But every factory has their own model drawn from the same thing. So instead of one global initiative across the whole company, everybody is looking at data for their own team, their own work group, and saying, what can we do tomorrow to create more like this and fewer like that? And that's called fractal engagement. Yeah? And it's all about getting the context right. You remember, context-specific, not context-free. Most change processes assume the world is context-free when it isn't. Some parts of the organization are completely different from the other part. You mustn't manage in the average, of a, the center of a normal distribution. You have to manage in the tails of a Pareto distribution, because that's where people sit. OK, a couple of final closing points on this. This is kind of like what we do on this sort of stuff. It's called pulse, sense, nudge. You first of all, pulse is deliberate because you take the pulse frequently. You pulse the system to see what it's like. You then make sense of what you see and you nudge the system to see if it's ready to move. You don't decide how it should be, you work with how it is. Remember the children's party story? So we do that for cybersecurity, we do it for culture. We just announced a big partnership with Gaping Void, if anyone knows the cartoonist. Okay, we've now got a cartoon wall of 49 cartoons about Agile, which I'll publish next week, which we produced with a lot of the signatories of the Agile Manifesto. We had a lot of fun designing these, all right? They're savagely sarcastic cartoons. So we present that as a wall. You choose the picture which most represents your company's culture. You tell a story about why you index it, and we draw your maps. Yeah, it's a much more effective way of measuring attitude, you know, readiness, fragile, and everything else. And it's fun. Yeah? In, and you notice I'm using the word fun, not happy. Right? Important distinction there. OK. So final couple of concepts. Key, and this is kind of like where I want to leave you, is to start to think about scaffolding. Now, I've given you three examples there. Right? One is bamboo scaffolding. If anybody's seen that in Southeast Asia, yeah? People throw up bamboo tied together with a rafter. It's hugely resilient, but it requires a lot of professional skill to put it together. Yeah? The other one is tubular scaffolding, which requires a lot less skill, but it's not as resilient or adaptive. And that's actually a classic trade-off. Yeah? High skill, high resilience. Low skill, less resilience. And it's not an either-or, it's a both-and. Yeah? But the point, and the third type of scaffolding is really interesting, that's a nutrient lattice, which gets put over a burn on the hand, so it creates a scaffolding around which the skin can regrow, and it dissolves as the nutrient is taken away. Now, we're actually doing a whole bunch of work at the moment, if anybody's interested, the final session on this is in Wales in a few weeks' time, to create a complexity-based approach to design thinking. Ever come across design thinking? Well, the reason I realized it needed a new approach is Adeo made it a commodity. So they start, in the minute somebody starts to run two-day accreditation courses in which you get a certificate for turning up, 
you know that the end of days has come, right? I mean, Agile is now a commodity as well. The other reason I did it is IBM adopted it as strategic. This is a golden heuristic. If IBM adopts something as strategic, you know it's coming to the end of its days. <laughs> because IBM is a late adopter company. That's what they are. It's, it's, it's actually a strength as well as a weakness. Right? So we're doing a complexity-based approach to design thinking, which breaks the linear process Instead of sort of finding stuff out, having ideas, producing something, we distribute the cap, distribute ethnography, and we distribute ideation. So we allow rapid acceptation rather than a linear process. And if anybody's interested in that, final session coming up, and we'll announce some new methods and tools from that. Now, a key concept on complexity-based approach to design thinking is actually the medical lattice. Is if you want to design a human system, you need to put scaffolding in place and allow the system to grow around that. But the key thing to remember is you take the scaffolding away. The trouble with most agile methods is they entirely focus on the scaffolding and they never, ever take it away. And that actually is the wrong way of thinking about things. So what I've tried to do is to give you some basic overview of both practice and theory. But the critical thing I want to leave you with, if you don't understand the theory, you shouldn't scale the practice. Or to make it simpler, if you don't understand why something worked, you shouldn't repeat what worked for you last time. Yeah, theory informed practice, the ability to understand constraints, gives you a high level of resilience and it gives you adaptive capacity. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Snowden. Thank you very much. Let's take some questions from our, from our audience. They normally go quiet at this point because they want coffee. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give them some coffee in a bit. Um, let me take some hands. There we are. Thank you for the uh, presentation, Dave. Uh, just a, a, a simple question, I hope. Complex system and complex adaptive system, are those terms interchangeable or do they mean different things? Uh, it's, technically, it's a complex adaptive system, right? But I think we're now at the phase where, to be honest, complexity means complex adaptive system. You still see people who do complicated and complex and say they're synonyms, yeah? Actually, they're not. So I wouldn't fuss too much. I'd check what somebody means, right? Um, so where, you, where somebody says complex system, they may mean complex adaptive, or they may just be using it as a synonym for complicated, yeah? The point about a complex adaptive system is everything interacts and everything changes as a result of the interaction. Yeah, so it's, and that's the key thing. It's not like something which is lots and lots of moving parts, but you know what the parts are. The other way to do it is you can take a complicated system apart and put it back together again. It doesn't change. If you try and take a complex system apart and put it back together again, it's always changed. Yeah? Any more? Hey, hello. Um, you mentioned earlier, here I am. Where are you? I can't see. Ah, I got you. Okay, cool. You mentioned earlier that people don't know what they want mm -hmm. when you ask them. If, uh, when they don't know what they want from software when you ask them, which probably drives them to uh, fast thinking, system one, according to Kahneman. You mentioned it later on. Yeah. What happens if you ask them, uh, if you reach out to them with questions that trigger system two? more slow thinking? Um, a couple of things on this. One is a lot of us really wish Clyde Eminem had walked across the corridor to his cognitive neuroscience colleagues before he started his research because we knew what he discovered. It's actually called autonomic novelty receptive processing. So most of the time your brain and your body make decisions for you without you thinking about it. And this is where people, there are some idiots like Dawkins who says this means you don't have free will. Because they say when you pull your hand away the brain fires afterwards. Well, actually, that's a Cartesian concept. The brain is firing to check if the automatic response was right. If the automatic response doesn't work, then the novelty receptive part comes in, but it's very rarely triggered. And that's why you have to introduce considerable cognitive stress before you trigger the change. Okay? Now, that doesn't happen in an interview process on a scalable basis, no matter how you train the interviewer. Right? The issue is to get huge diversity in real-time observations. 
And the, again, I didn't go into this, but the way people remember things after the event is radically different from the way they remember at the time. Yeah? You get what's called retrospective coherence. So that's why we would get everybody in the user population. The cost is a lot less than sending out a systems analyst just to diarize every frustration or idea they have, and then we draw the fitness landscapes, those maps. And where you get clusters on those maps, that's where you go and ask questions. Right? You don't start the questioning process until you know that there's something there which needs to be looked at. And that the trouble with systems analysts is they've got hypotheses in their brain before they go in. And one other 101 bit of cognitive neuroscience, if you conduct more than two interviews, your brain forms a subconscious hypothesis after the second interview, and you literally only hear things that match that hypothesis thereafter. No? So anybody's a systems analyst, sorry guys, all right? Yeah, that's life, right? And so work with it, not try and pretend you didn't do it. Yeah. And by the way, the, the general point I'll make is the, the, the Kleinerman's book is interesting. He produces wonderful examples, yeah? Again, Nobel Prizes to economics generally come when that economic theory is going out of fashion big time, right? Um, Donut economics is really worth reading if you haven't read that yet, right? But the point is, he's empirical observation deriving theory. We knew that theory before. Right? And what we haven't got is people who are transdisciplinary. Yeah, for him to spend 20 years of his life discovering something which is already known at a biological level and therefore was more useful. And one of the things we desperately need in industry at the moment is generalists. We've got nothing but specialists. <clears throat> and this is a big problem in systems architecture and IT design. Everybody is a deep specialist, nobody is a generalist. And a collection of specialists is not the same thing as a generalist. It works very differently. Any more? Hi, David. Um, I'm, I'm up here. Oh, cool. Quick question about uh, <clears throat> liminarity. Could you revisit what you meant by liminarity and uh, okay. how Scrum is a liminal technique? Yeah, I, I ran over that quite quickly. Um, liminality is a key concept in anthropology. Yeah? One of the reasons I introduced it to Kinevin, and by the way, Kinevin has changed over time. That's one of its strengths. It changes based on practice and new theory. It's not a one-time model. Liminality in anthropology, if, in so-called primitive societies, if you put on a mask, in fact, Greek theater is a good example of this, all right? When the actor puts on the mask, they become the character. But there's a liminal period before they become. It's the act of transition between the two. That's what liminality means, right? So the whole point, liminality is very valuable because it means you don't yet commit. Yeah? So the strength of Scrum is that you kind of like got things worked out. You've got a user executive, you've got things defined, you've got a backlog, you've got things you want to do, right? So you do them, but you vary how you do it and how you execute, right? So it's a liminal technique in complex. It actually takes too long for a true complex technique and it doesn't have enough parallelism or enough diversity. So one of the ways you can hugely improve Scrum is by using some of the techniques I talked about before you get into the Scrum process. And I think, you know, one of the things which went wrong with Agile is, and it starts off, most of it is actually XP. All right, if you go back to the original stuff. But then Scrum comes along and it creates something structured. Yeah? And I think Agile would have been a lot better if it had kept with the XP pathway rather than the Scrum pathway, which isn't to say Scrum isn't useful. The trouble is the XP people can't talk with ordinary human beings. Right? Um, and that's why they didn't get adopted en masse. So you've got to knock people down as you build them up, all right, in that sense. Right? So one of the things we've forgotten is Agile is a broad church of multiple theories and methods. It's been captured by the certifiers and the method people, for whom the method becomes the only thing of importance. And fascinatingly, IT is the only profession which requires permanent coaches. Yeah, apart from sports, all right? And very sorry, most Agile people do not look like they could run 100 meters, you know, 10 out. Yeah, fundamentally, the coaches are scaffolding, but they stay in place. Right? And we focus on the method and method compliance and adoption of methods. I mean, let's go back to SAFE, all right? One of the great successes of SAFE is it started off by being sold on a pyramid selling scheme. Yeah, you did the four-day course, you were then allowed to do the three-day course, provided you paid dean a royalty, and you had no experience. You look at the trainers on the safe guidelines, and none of them have actually coded. They're just professional trainers repeating stuff from slides. 
And that played to a fundamental weakness in the Agile community, which is training revenue was the most important thing for people, and to the desire to be, say you're Agile, but look structured. What Dean is now doing is putting quality control in to stop anybody else doing that to him. Now, the guy's a good marketer, right? And if you've done a big safe implementation, nobody will admit it failed because you spent millions of dollars doing it. And that other by, that's, I'm being very cynical now, this is a standard approach, the big consultancy do it all the time. Get people to spend a million dollar on a two year process, they will never ever say it failed. Yeah, in terms of the way it works. And we've got to take a portfolio approach, we've got to take a multiple methods approach, and we've got to take an approach which has discipline in it, yeah, and discipline is very different from something with the excessive structure of all of the scaled methods. And I'm picking off safe, but they all suffer from this. Thank you very, very much. Uh, we won't take any more, I'm afraid, because I'd like you to go out and get a bit of a rest and get some coffee before we have the next session. Professor Snowden, thank you so, Pleasure. so much for that fantastic talk. Excellent. Excellent.